My guest this morning, Professor Kwesi Ening, he's Director, Faculty of Academic Affairs and Research, Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. David Ofosu uh, he is Senior Partner, AB and David Africa. Uh, he joins us particularly for the second discussion. And Frank Davis, a senior member, the GBA, immediate past president, Greater Accra Bar. He was uh, Mogabi and chairman, governing board of the DVLA, Professor Apia, Apia J. Etia. Could you appear J. Etia? is uh, with the School of Law, University of Ghana, uh, has specialties and interest in gender issues and also matters con concerning the continent of Africa and regional uh, issues. Gentlemen, thank you so very much for making the time to join us on Newsfile. Well, thank you and good morning. Thank you. Great. Uh, in the very final segment, we'll be joined by Carl Tofor, lecturer and sports journalist, Gary Al Smith, sports, uh, Joy Sports, and Kujo Adair Mensa, former columnist uh, of the Kotoko Express and uh, sports analyst. Um, so I'm here in the studio with uh, Frank Davis. I say uh, warm welcome to you. It's been a long time we had your news file. Thank you. <laughs> right. Right. Pleasure to be here once again. Great. And uh, you were missing at the bar conference. Uh, I've never, I don't remember a bar conference that I didn't see you, except yeah, it was, this. It was, was, was quite unfortunate. I was outside your position, but I did right. a virtual conference. Great. I was great. a good spirit. Great, great, <laughs> great. And I'm, I suppose you enjoyed it. Um, surprising, but for Istudanabe's desert uh, pastures, that, you know, huge place, we couldn't have had the conference in Borga. I, I, I must say, uh, I take this singular opportunity to congratulate the leadership of the bar for such a remarkable conference. I mean, uh, kudos to my very good friend on council, Afok, and then to Namon, to Sambian, and all the guys mm. who did that fantastic job. It was, it was really well organized and on the yeah. back of the e-voting. I, I enjoyed every bit of the That's conference. great. Kudos, my friends. And I'm sorry great. I wasn't there. He created an anxious moment. That's okay. We understand. <laughs> we understand. Uh, we got notes from you suggesting that you were missing it. Yeah. And I could understand that you really missed it. Badly. Right. And uh, thank you all, everyone. Uh, when I was there, uh, I, I was greeted with so much love. Uh, the very first day I arrived, I got this smoke. And I came back with a bag load of smokes. And this was given to me by uh, Lou Paul T, who is the Gorogo chief uh, at the Gorogo uh, chief, uh, Gorogo chief uh, uh, in Tongo. And he works at the Sandema Hospital, Bosa, North Municipality. Thank you all so very much. We thank the police also. They were in their great numbers and helped us. Now, let's go to talk about Africa affairs. Um, and we have had uh, some distinguished analysts speak about the issue uh, briefly. Let's hear uh, two of them before we come to our guests. We are required to take informed decisions on these matters that will have long-term consequences for the stability and the defense of the democratic values of our region. I count on you, Excellencies, to help proffer durable solutions to the crisis. And I'm confident that, as in the past, we will rise to the occasion. I wish us fruitful deliberations, and I thank you for your attention. The Constitution has been overthrown, according to the pushists. So they need to write a new Constitution. And it's not going to be a simple matter. I think the, my colleague, the political scientist, can speak to that. It's not a very simple matter of throwing away the constitution that was re-engineered by Conde, which served as approximate cause for his overthrow, and then restoring the former constitution is going to be an entirely new process of bringing together segments of Guinean society, as they are now, you know, telling us, you know, to try and get some consensus 
around this new constitution. Six months is too short for me. ECOWAS has missed the plot. And I think it's not too late, as we did in the Gambia, to send a high-level team of seven leaders or retired former heads of state to go and engage them and work out a plan, a transition plan. Yeah. So far, we know that the leaders are working out their own transition plan. They are consulting segments of Guinean society. So they are adopting the right approach to right the wrongs that Conde, you know, um, effected on the state. Right. So that's uh, Colonel Festus Abwaje retired on the demands by ECOWAS on the military junta. And first you had uh, President Akufuado, uh, who, is, who also leads the ECOWAS, opening the emergency um, summit, so to speak, meeting that they had here in Accra, following which he himself has flown out to uh, see to bringing some, you know, sanity in the place. Uh, let me begin with Professor Kujar Piajetia. And last week you were on the show and you literally joined the Guinean people in, in justifying what has happened. What do you say about what the ECOWAS leaders are demanding? Thank you, um, Samson. And uh, first of all, let me say that I admire your smog very much. <laughs> and so I hope you get one for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, there have been a number of new developments within the past week or so. Some positive, some also not so uh, positive. But I think uh, um, on the whole, we see some trend towards helping to resolve the issue. And for me, one key thing is the issue of how democracy can be restored in, in Guinea. And we see ECOWAS trying to flex its muscles and indicating to the coup makers that they don't have a place in the, in the um, democratic dispensation that ECOWAS wants uh, Guinea to, uh, to, to chat. And to me, that is the new thing about um, ECOWAS move, that they should return the country to constitutional rule in six months, but they should not take part in the elections, if what um, I, I read in the news mm. was right. Yeah, and, last so, week, and last week, you referred us to the protocols or some of their own rules that they have set, which, which does not allow those who topple the government to be part of the of the new government that's right mm. yes so to me that is a positive i think because to me the role of the military in politics is simply to be on the side of the masses to change government where it has become well nigh impossible to change government through the ballot box or the agreed formula in the constitution of the particular country so if um, as a result of what we saw in Guinea during the time of Conde before he was overthrown. He engineered the constitution, doctored it, and introduced a third term, uh, which led to some serious human rights violations taking place. And he's uh, going ahead to um, put into pre in prison some politicians and so on. Clearly, it indicated that there was no other way for uh, democratic change to occur in the country. And so, in my opinion, the military uh, did the right thing by uh, ensuring the overthrow of the regime. But as I indicated, the military is supposed to play an apolitical role in politics or in democracy or governance in a particular country. So they are to, side or, uh, to be on the side of the, of the masses. And after the dictatorship is overthrown, they leave the scene and allow democracy to return. Mm. And so they should have actually made that decision themselves or should have indicated to the people that that's what we're going to do. But I think ECOWAS having taken that decision, ECOWAS has made a progressive step. And we, we, it is hoped that it will, the, the military junta will agree to that process. And the whole thing will be how within the six month space there will be no opportunity or room for um, corruption and 
maladministration or a situation where the military regime could set up um, a proxy in any of the political parties that may that uh, may, may decide to contest the elections. The, the, the regime is already saying that, um, well, ECOWAS has suspended it, and they are like, we don't care we, anyway. We are we are answerable to the Guinean people who have given us overwhelming support, and they have begun a process of. Uh, if you like, rooting out corruption, corruption investigations, among others. They are not immediately thinking about a transition. Yeah, that is where the problem is. That is where the problem is. That is why in the first place, um, ECOWAS has come in late. Because if at the time um, Conde was misbehaving and doctoring the constitution, they had been uh, strict on him and ensured that the rules that they themselves have set in the um, ECOWAS protocol, supplementary protocol on democracy and, and governance, and, and, and the, OA, uh, the AU various documents, in, instruments on, on ensuring democracy and governance in Africa. It would have been where we are today. But as things stand, I think the, the military has finished their job. Hmm. Any attempt for them to remain in power and to say that they are, they are um, ensuring that there's corruption, it's, it's ruled out, and so on, it's not their job. They should prepare the ground and leave the scene. And when they have done that, then they will be applauded by the people and okay. it will ensure that democracy is restored in the country. Very briefly, let me know how you think about this. Should ECOWAS or AU rather be suspending countries when their leaders refuse to listen? At the time, they are taking steps that uh, are undemocratic. Like at the time when Alpha Conde, we understand that the ECOWAS leaders spoke to him privately. They brought pressure to bear, but he simply ignored them. Should they rather be suspending the countries at such times and issuing the sanctions at such times rather than wait for uh, a coup? Well, I think that the, the ECOWAS move is a little bit harsh. And at this stage, we are talking about how to resolve um, a, a very difficult situation. And ECOWAS needs to uh, ensure that its um, negotiation mechanisms, mediation mechanisms are triggered in, in such a way and applied in such a way that yeah. it will help resolve the matter. In one sense, we need to applaud the military for the step they took in ensuring that democracy is um, restored. But the key thing is that they are not supposed to play a part in the, in the new democracy that is going to take place. Mm. They are just supposed to pave the way for democracy to return to power. Mm. The military does not have a place in democracy in that, is, in that sense. Okay. So sanctions, in my opinion, were a little bit rushed um, because you want to make sure that you coax these people and then they will leave the scene. They still have the the, the um, military might to remain in power, and if sanctions are, are applied, in most cases, rather the people on the ground who will be affected. Mm. So I think that um, it, it should have been a step by step approach to give them a little space, maybe two months, three months, give them timelines within one month. Uh, maybe people have, would have been released from prison within the next month. We think about whether a new constitution should be um, um, uh, built right from the ground, or they just amend the constitution, take out the terrorism ones that Conde introduced, and keep what it is. So these timelines, every month or so, when progress is made, then ECOWAS will say, we give you the take. You have done well. Keep going. But if they don't meet the mark for a particular mm -hmm. time frame, mm -hmm. then some limited sanctions will be applied. I think that is a way to go. Okay. Otherwise, these people can be um, can be stuffed and say that we are not negotiating anymore. Do whatever you can do. And there's not much that ECOWAS can do. Mm. All right. Um, Professor Kwesiening, how do you read what is going on in Guinea and President uh, Akufuado and his uh, counterparts, Alassane Ouattara and the uh, team that is gone there. Samson, thank you very much. But let me start by 
greeting my senior boy Frank Davis <laughs> in the studio. I've been seeing him for ages, so it's nice to see him. It's cool. Yeah, he, he, he hasn't changed very much. Um, and greet uh, Quedu also. But let me also say this. Something I think you need to lead a campaign for a hashtag that says, we stand with Dampare. Bold, daring, strong, principled, and prepared to take on the powers that be. When you have pastors that are banting in front of their congregation, preaching about the way they can bribe people within the executive, within national security, and if you know how to wash your hands, nothing. The Lord does not work for you. Most, most of it is empty bragging. They, they don't do what they, they, they can't do some of the things they say. They're empty bragging. You don't think? Yes, but when you brag before gullible people, they buy it. Okay. And when you have a law enforcement chief being able to show that the law works, and this empty braggart is nothing but an empty shell, mm. then it sends a signal that we all need to comply, particularly when that officer himself stays in traffic. Right. So the hashtag, I identify with Dan Parry, is something that I accede to 100%. Uh, I'll do that and more. I'll do that and more, uh, particularly against people who have no morals at all, uh, like this uh, class of charlatans who are now, they, they are beginning to even rain curses on the, I, on the IGP and suggesting that certain things might happen to him because he's touched, you know, like the Bible says, touch not my anointed. <laughs> anyway, hey, thank you. When the anointed <laughs> are quack people, charlatans, gangsters, who use the name of God to con and trick people, then they are the people who will be cursed and they are the people who will be brought down. Now, right. Guinea. Yeah. Guinea is unfortunate, but it is not altogether surprising. I agree with some of the things that my dear friend Pedro has said, but Pedro, the military will not leave. Why should they? <laughs> Precisely because those who ought to have implemented and ensured that the rules that we had all voluntarily signed on to would be complied with. No single ECOWAS member state has been intimidated by its members to sign on to any of the protocols on democracy and good governance and on conflict prevention. So what I agree with Kujo on is that we need to accept that the elite consensus that has been built around shared values, shared norms, cooperative behavior, does not work first because the commission has failed to play the role of a supranational commission capable of using multiple instruments at its disposal to bring about behavioral change. Two, that the heads of states themselves have failed to bring peer pressure to bear. And Samson, I don't buy this ex post facto argument that, oh, we engaged him. So why didn't you tell us when you were engaging him? Because right now, it's about credibility. I mean, the credibility of the whole institution is presently at stake. How does this institution that we all agree does have an important role to play. Mm -hmm. Play or, or perform that function in a manner that brings about trust, that brings about stakeholder buy-in. Now, sanctions. What we are seeing now is actually a retrogression of what ECOWAS has been doing from 1980. If you look at ECOWAS's intervention and response mechanisms to unconstitutional changes of government, you would notice that over time, and particularly since 2000, that there has been more of a, of a softening of ECOWAS's position. 
it allows the crisis to happen, and then there's always a six months to a 24 month transitional rule. And it doesn't seem to me very much that we are using the knowledge at our disposal to say, and here I agree with Kwejo once more, what are the incremental steps that can be taken to ensure that unconstitutional changes of government or extension of regimes do not take place? And here, I want to come back to what does it mean when we say unconstitutional change of government? ECOWAS seems to have a very narrow interpretation of what that sentence means. That unconstitutionality only comes when the military steps in. Mm -hmm. I would argue that we need to go back a couple of steps. That when the governing elite of any country, of any, of any uh, signatory state, changes the constitution, but prior to that, ensures that you know, civil societies are under attack, the media is biased, uh, opposition access to state media is reduced, you know, uh, Supreme Courts and are uh, filled with supporters of the party, you know, electoral commissions are intimidated. All those are steps in ensuring that unconstitutional, you know, you know takeovers do mm. happen, yeah. either yeah. through the yeah. courts or through the barrel of the gun. Mm. You, you, now, you, you say you say the military will not leave, at least not now. Um, so the efforts that's being led by President Akufuado and Alassane Ouattara, you don't think will yield anything? Well, sanctions. I, I think if we look at the public reception of the of the ECOWAS delegation that went to Conakry. There were two things that we can learn from the videos that we have seen. One, that the people of Guinea are not in support of the sanctions regime and the timetable. Two, that there is popular Guinean support for, for, for the coup. And I would say once more, unfortunately so. Because I don't give the military regime more than six months to 12 months the public support will begin to shift for a much more inclusive and uh, governance and a return to democracy. Those guns will be turned against the public that is supporting them now. And Guinea's history is replete with, with these you know, military uh, excesses towards the civilian populace. So the real question becomes, how can we intervene in a manner that brings about behavioral change? Sanctions themselves will not do it. Autocratic regimes are usually able to resist sanctions more effectively than democracies. And particularly Guinea's case is very instructive here because Guinea is not a small fly-by-night country. It has more than 60% of some of the world's most critical natural resources necessary for fueling China's industrialization process. So when you do two things, freeze banking accounts, and I doubt if any of those new leaders have any banking accounts elsewhere <laughs> in which there are a couple of hundreds of dollars, mm. they are going to open new banking accounts. Right. They are going to open it. Not in the West, but certainly, probably. Okay. Let, let me get uh, Frank Davis's views on this. And then uh, uh, David Ofosu Dote may help us to appreciate what the, what the impact or consequences or implication of the ban or the suspension will be for the people. Or it's actually, you know, inconsequential. And that's why they can simply say, you know, you can go to hell with it. Um, Alassane Ouattara joining the president, has become one issue that many have criticized. Do you support the fact that that is very problematic and that the leaders didn't think through that? Uh, good morning once again to your cherished listeners and, and, and viewers. I, 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 this, this was something I, I wouldn't have wished to comment on, but 
You have got me in the box, so <laughs> I'll do exactly that. Um, it's 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 a two-way traffic. Rather, rather unfortunate that um, such an excellent president, uh, Alassane Ouattara, has been caught uh, in such a quagmire. Uh, because the running commentary is that he also, in quotes, manipulated the constitution and got himself a third term in office. Uh, that is a stick uh, which can never go. And if you weigh that against what is happening in, 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 in Conakry now, uh, Alpha Conde has also manipulated the constitution and got himself a third uh, much against the protestation of the dominant opposition and other organized societies in, 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 in Guinea. Uh, I, I honestly would wish that we give the ECOWAS as of states and governments the opportunity to try to sail through this very difficult proposition because it was him as if the military are emboldened by the fact that they have, in course, justifiably overthrown a democratic president who was being undemocratic in courts. So they, they want to believe that they have the support of the Guinean people, which has manifested in the short run. Like my good friend, engineer in school, Professor Kuzenin said, mm. Uh, for how long can that support reign? Uh, it will get weary and the people will want to have a return to democratic rule. No matter the options, I think much, most often than not, uh, people prefer a rule of law than rule by gun. So yeah. we'll get to that threshold. But I, 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 I have very sad memories for, for Alassana. Otherwise, he is a very excellent president. So mm. maybe that is where uh, the problem is shifted. He finds himself in a very fast run. Mm. Mm. And, and do you think the question I, I ask um, Professor Pierre J. Etia and uh, which um, uh, Professor Enin supports, do you think that AU and the ECOWAS should rather be issuing sanctions when democratic ideals and principles are being violated in these countries or member countries rather than wait until you know the whole thing is lost then there's a military junta and say hey you guys you shouldn't belong i i couldn't agree with you the more something but you see we will have to look at the dynamics carefully you are a president of your republic uh, another man is the president of his republic now I, I, I would have thought, I would have thought, there, there is, I mean, the equivalents of states are saying that they had a very reasoned discussion with him. They pleaded with him not to do what he did. And willingly, he went ahead and did what has all come to hit us now. Uh, I think that, I think that moving forward, the sanctions should be applied before any military despot decides to take the gun. This time we were fortunate, it was just a bloodless coup. It was just a simple overthrow, leave the space, mm. and let us see what we can do. But uh, when, 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 when you get people who are stuck in their minds as to what to do, something, no matter the persuasion, uh, it will be very difficult for you to get them to go. And when he thinks that he is in charge of his own country, he's a master of all his service, and then you are a president of another country. Forget about ECOWAS. I mean, yes, he will subscribe to the principles of ECOWAS. But when he's hell-bent on doing something, you sitting in your country as president, four or five presidents are going to tell him that, look, don't do what you're doing. Mm. He might listen to you, but what the extent? And if he decides to do something to, to the contrary. They, 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 are, they have signed onto, you know, a, a supranational, you know, organization that we want to be united and we want to use one body and have one voice we set the rules actually set up courts you know to do things so if they are not 
amenable to those rules, then what is the use of ECOWAS and what's the use of AU? Something I, 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 I can understand where the difficulty is, but this is what the AU should be looking at critically now. This is what has confronted us. Mm. And I think very definitive steps should be taken to call this once and for all. Okay. Where presidents think that because there are laws of what they survey, mm. even though if there's a charter and you have signed on, you can decide to do whatever you want to do. I think moving forward, this is the time mm. for ECOWAS to crack the whip. That if you don't subscribe, you don't subscribe. But if you subscribe, you should be amenable yeah. to our regime. I, I, I don't think this is well. Right. And the equations of states, mm. I think, are finding themselves in a very, very uncomfortable situation. Right. I, 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 I wish all the best for mm. His Excellency, the President of the Republic. He is leading this, this fight. And we should all pray that they are able to achieve whatever they've gone to connect it to do. Right. Uh, Pro Professor PJ, help us. What's the binding nature? Of all the protocols that they sign onto as uh, uh, member countries to echo us, and why shouldn't they respect it? If they, they will not respect them, what's the point of the organization? Well, that's a very uh, good question to ask. First of all, the the ECOWAS protocols the AU instruments, the, um, if you talk about the AU Constitutive Act itself, it has provisions on sanctions being applied. Right. And so these are all binding, legally binding instruments um, that countries who are members of these international organizations are supposed to adhere to. Unfortunately, though, when we talked that the AU and ECOWAS would have been would have obtained a status where more respect will be will be given to its provisions, especially in this time and age where we're talking about democracy. In this time and age where the notion of non-indifference, for example, is a rule, or is supposed to be the rule in the AU, at least it is clearly stated in its constitutive acts that it could set up um, a non-intervention um, um, interventionist approach to ensure that impunity is does not reign and they can quickly apply sanctions and ensure that order is prevailed. Now what is unfortunate though is that as Chrissy said, the notion or an understanding of unconstitutional change in government has been given a very narrow interpretation. It is still seen largely in the context of a coup d'etat. But as I mentioned last week, um, there are different five different types of unconstitutional changes in government, which the AU itself has recognized. And the Afakonde one falls into the fifth category, which is where a constitution is tampered with or adopted to allow for extended stay in power, and which we um, generally refer to as statemism even though it could be indefinite. For example, if you look at Togo, I think Gabon, and so on, they, are, they now have indefinite terms for their leaders. So, which brings into question, if you go back to the Lome um, Declaration on Unconstitutional Changes in Governments, it spells out what should be done if an unconstitutional change in government takes place. But that definition is limited to where there is a coup d'etat. Because the, the, the provision says that in case there is an unconstitutional change in government, the government that is in power, uh, that came to power through unconstitutional means, should return the country to, uh, to constitutional rule within um, a six month period. Mm -hmm. And that is what the uh, <laughs> leaders are trying to apply now. But what sanctions would they apply if they are going by this Lome Declaration, where there is um, an unconstitutional change in government whereby we have this, this terrorism issue in, in, in play. Should the government decide to return the country to constitutional rule? And what kind of sanctions would apply in that case? The, the AU position is silent on this. And that is where it, it probably gives room for uh, or embodies those who want to doctor the constitutions and remain in power. 
but that the Lume declaration itself is is not um, the only instrument we can we can resort to. The AU Constitutive Act itself is clear that mm. in case of such a situation, the Peace and Security Council is supposed to make a decision and to ensure that there could be intervention. Unfortunately, throughout the history of the AU, it has not been able to take such a step. Mm. It attempted it in Burundi, but they, in the end, it, it couldn't go ahead. So the question that you're asking is a very good question. Why is it that we belong to such organizations, but we don't want to respect its, its um, laws or provisions and uh, protocols and so on? It is all about the fact that um, we have not been able to transform the international organization to have a character of its own. The international organization is supposed to take away some sovereignty from the member states. Right. And member states should be willing to cede part of their sovereignty to the international organization to enable it to have a character of its own and to be able to apply sanctions where necessary. And states are supposed to obey. Mm. With Ecuador in particular, it is transforming itself for it has reached a stage where it has become a supranational body. So that any decision that it makes, you don't have to say, I'm going back to my country to see if uh, my country will be willing to apply the law or not. It takes effect immediately. And so we have reached a stage where um, these international organizations in Africa have moved a notch higher, mm. but everything remains more or less on paper. Mm. So it, it becomes critical that mm. we don't leave the, the running of these international organizations to our political leaders only. So, so, you... so the, the, the dream, the ideal of the, from the years of uh, Pan-Africanism, uh, Nkrumah, Secretary, Nyerere, all coming together uh, up to the point of uh, the, the setting up of the AU, now OAU, uh, to the 1980 Lagos Treaty, and then subsequently, almost all the regions have had their own, uh, if you like, bodies, unions, coming together for the purpose. You have the ECOWAS, you have the SADC, you have the COMESA, uh, you have the CENSAD, all of them, the ECAS, you know, now have gravitated and ultimately come to AFTA, which Ghana is uh, hosting the headquarters, where as many as 44 of the 55 countries have signed on to. And the idea is that this will be the biggest move to the union that we were expecting. So if we get the economic union, we can translate that gradually into the political union. We have the 2063, is it 63 agenda? 63, yes. That they have adopted for themselves, looking for democracies in Africa, which is ideal looking at the EU and the rest of them. You are saying this is also elusive? It is elusive. And it is elusive because um, African countries still want to enjoy the benefits of colonialism in a, in a certain way. And I say so with respect to in, in two respects. First, colonialism left behind certain structures and institutions which were used to suppress um, the people during the, the, the colonial period and during the anti-colonial struggle. When um, um, independence came, our leaders um, tried to keep these laws and apply them against their own citizenry. Secondly, African leaders are reproducing part of the colonial powers which were, which were abolished or abrogated when colonialism came into place. Mm. And so the kind of democracy that we have is, um, to say it brandly, a, a caricatured one. And so long as the principal interest is self-interest, where security is exaggerated and imagined uh, in order to clamp down on people. And in the end, it is not about human security, but a state-centric form of security, which in the end is about regime security. Then we don't see a situation where democracy has entrenched itself so that we can move beyond these unconstitutional changes in government and ensure that 
we arrive at a threshold where human security is the way to go, where we say that until people have been allowed to take part in governance, until we have tolerance for the views of the minority, until we're able to design a kind of democracy where the, uh, uh, it is not about the, uh, the first, um, the winner takes all kind of mentality. We are going to have these problems here and there. And so it is important that we re-examine the whole concept of democracy because that is what feeds into the challenges we are having. When in the 90s, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, about three quarters of African countries changed their constitutions to allow for um, multi-party democracy, reintroduce civil society, um, um, activism, and so on. It was a new liberation that came to Africa. But the trend is changing. It's changing again, where we have illiberal democracies springing up here and there, where we have mm. third termism springing up here and there. And, you know, it always gets to a point where people begins to fight back. Even after the fall of the Berlin Wall, mm. the, the Arab Spring we started. So it's um, about four or five countries in North Africa, mm. you know, getting into that. Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, and so on. And a few countries in, in, in even Cameroon and others, they also try to fight and, 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 and um, call for change. Gotcha. So tension and insecurity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, still are still there because people always want to ensure that they, they are able to have the opportunity to take part in governance. So the human security approach is where we should look for. Okay. And uh, make sure that <clears throat> it takes it. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we can't end this discussion uh, without me asking uh, Professor uh, Kwesienin. You say this is uh, unfortunate but not surprising. And the military is not going to leave, or at least not soon. Um, but six months, uh, the order is for them to return the country's constitutional rule within six months. Do you think this is re realistic? Um, I'm asking a question. You seem to have preempted the answer already. If it's not realistic, how do we resolve this? Because this must be resolved. Well, I think we can resolve this by being honest with ourselves and understanding the geopolitics around the coup itself. I mean, as I was saying prior to the break, Guinea is not some fly-by-night little country that you can order. It has 82 million tons of iron ore. Mm. That was the 2019 assessment. This is in hundreds of billions of dollars worth. It is that iron ore that drives China's industrialization game. Not only that, the Russian aluminum industry, the Preska and his people uh, through the company Rusal are very active also in Guinea's um, economy. We now know that the Russian mercenary group, the Wagner group, has been invited by Mali to come and provide security. Through the Rusal mining group, Wagner will eventually come to Guinea. So I agree with Kwego very much, and then also with Frank Davis, that I think this is the time for ECOWAS's heads of state and the commission itself to bring together the key minds in the sub-region and to say, look, how do we deal with these unconstitutional changes of power? And how can we understand the grander geopolitical, geostrategic context within which those who undermine constitutionalism feed into? Because when Conde played these games, both in the 2010 and the 2016 elections. He was playing the game between China on one hand and Israel through Mr. Steinmetz and his family on the other. So Conde's slide into unconstitutionalism, one, because he was corrupt, he liked power, and he had around him 
the institutional framework for corruption and for hang, hang, hanging on to power. But he also, it also fed into the grander geostrategic game. And I'm wondering whether in giving Guinea six months, and I doubt very much if you consider this, whether we looked at the larger geostrategic game. We failed to understand that in Mali, because in Mali, the French president rather childishly said, oh, then I'm going to pull French troops out. Of course, when the two leaders had been educated in, in Russia, Mr. Putin is sitting in, in Moscow and smiling nicely because he has played the long game. And the chess bricks are beginning to fall on his side. Okay, so Russia is making a big move into Mali because France and ECOWAS miscalculated, and we seem to be miscalculating in Guinea. So Kujo's point and Frank's point about the need to come around the table and think through what options we have, what instruments we have, elicit compliance from those who have signed on to these documents is very key. We don't have the power and the privilege of wasting time anymore. Because if you look at the videos from Mali, from Niger, from Nigeria, and from elsewhere, including Guinea, the, the frustration of the citizenry is bubbling to the fore. Mm. We cannot and we must not allow that to get out of control. Okay. Thank you so very much, Professor Kwesienin and Professor uh, Kwejo Apieje Etia. Uh, Professor Kwesienin leaves us now, but Professor Apieje stays with us to go to the next issue about the Ghana Bar Association and matters arising from his conference on tax and <clears throat> in discipline or misconduct to uh, accusations that it is at the lowest confidence in the association is at the lowest in history and that it has lost its voice as a critical civil society uh, to help shape democracy. Um, David Ofosu Dote uh, also joins us for that discussion. Um, but we take a break and return for that discussion. However, I feel sad that since 1963, we started this uh, union game with the OAU, <clears throat> went through, we have done all sorts of things and then eventually come to the after, which we uh, are told is the boldest, you know, um, attempt <clears throat> to realize this dream. And we still can't seem to realize it within Africa. What is wrong with us? We'll be right back. There is much, a lot of individualism that has crept into both the professions and also to the, the democratic process itself where people are more concerned about themselves as opposed to looking at the general welfare of the people. So